Welcome to our Discoveries Author event. I'm Lisa. I'm the Reader Development Librarian for Suffolk Libraries. And this evening, I'm utterly delighted to welcome the extraordinary author, Dawny Walton. Welcome, Dawny, and thank you so much for joining us. It is my absolute pleasure, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you. And my colleague, Melissa, is gonna start with the first question. Over to you, Melissa. Hi, Donny. So nice to have you. Thank okay, you. so first off, um, how did it feel to see your book published? Well, thank you so much for asking that question, Melissa, because it has definitely been a rush of emotions. I'm a bit of a late bloomer. Um, I will be 45 next month. And the fact that I am at this point of my life where I'm realizing a lifelong dream <laughs> And a story that has resonated so personally for me is extraordinary. Of course, that's also tempered by the fact that it looks a little different than I dreamed it would because of the pandemic. Um, you know, okay. one of the things, yeah, that you really dream about as an author is being in a bookstore and there being people. Yeah, to meet of course, and meeting your readers in person. Yes. Absolutely. And so, you know, that's a little bit sad, but I do love that there are events like this that really connect us and really honestly give people a lot more accessibility um, to meet, well, meet in air quotes, <laughs> virtually the authors and, and, and also for me to be able to meet other authors and to do events with different people is, is really cool. Um, the other thing that sort of tempers it in this moment, if I'm being honest, is, you know, there's a lot going on in the United States right now in terms of, um, you know, uh, trauma toward Black people and, my UK publication was the date of the Chauvin verdict. So there was a lot of joy over my UK publication and, but also a lot of tension and anxiety and mixed with relief, of course. Um, so it's a lot to all hold together. It's definitely a unique experience. You know, I think it's, you, I could write a whole book about the experience. Um, <laughs> it's a lot to process, isn't it? It's absolutely a lot to process, but overall, it's been an incredible experience, and I'm so happy this book is out in the world. It's really staggering to think about. And I, I was saying to Dawny just before we started that I absolutely love her book. It's just extraordinarily good and was also named as one of the most anticipated novels of this year by Vogue, The Independent, The Oprah magazine. And there's an amazing quote I'd just like to read from The Oprah magazine, which I couldn't agree with more, which is Walton's fabulous debut novel is an utterly fresh take on finding one's voice on systemic racism and sexism and on freedom of expression, that these heavy subjects don't weigh down this hugely entertaining novel are testament to Walton's deafness and skill. And what is that like for you, Dorne? This is your first book and you're getting reviews like that. I mean, it's wonderful to hear and really gratifying to know that the things that I intended to do are, are translating, are coming across, um, because, you know, I wanted to broach some more serious topics, but I mm. wanted to do it in a way that, you know, wasn't preachy or, you know, that remained entertaining and that had a lightness to it and also was paying homage to um, the joy and camaraderie and resilience of, of people. Um, and so I'm glad that uh, people are seeing that in the book. It's a huge compliment. Definitely is the case. It's, it really is extraordinary. As I've already, um, I'll be saying it a lot this evening, I absolutely loved it. And it's, I would say it's quite easily one of the best books I've ever read. And I read a lot of books because I do a lot of author talks. And yeah. in the introduction, Donna, you talked about 
this book, this amazing creation, kind of started from a question that you had in your mind. And would you tell the audience about that and how this book came to life for you? Sure. Um, one of the things that I love to do for the advanced copy that you had is I got to, to write a letter to, to my readers and talk about the things that inspired this book. And, and that was really growing up in the 90s, being a teenager in Florida, in, in a town that isn't all palm trees and beach, it actually feels quite Southern, uh, quite country, and being drawn to music that felt a bit strange, a bit taboo for me to like, simply because I didn't see reflections of myself in that music. So it was a lot of alternative rock, a lot of indie rock, punk bands, from both you know, the United Kingdom and the United States. And the book really comes out of my desire to insert a figure into history that I would have idolized at that age. And I wanted to build this rock star who was stylish and cool and funny and messy like rock stars we love, you know, yeah. just a bit of that, but also, loving the skin that she's in and loving um, being a Black woman, being very proud of that, being very vocal about that and everything that it would mean for her politically. And that was the key for me, is that Opal would be able to hold all of those things in a way that I wasn't able to, you know, until I was a bit older and off to college and understanding that no matter what I was into or enjoyed, that nothing could ever mean that it, that I wasn't Black anymore. Yeah. You know, it took a while to kind of understand that because things are so racialized in, in the United States. And um, so that's, that was the inspiration really for the book and, and my dream that I was trying to achieve. And you've obviously just mentioned the fabulous character in your book, Opal Jewel, who is fabulous and feisty and just this amazing, strong character. And I know that you, you said again at the beginning that her voice kind of came to you. But did you in any her or any of the other characters in your book, were they influenced in any way by people, you know, or artists that you admire? Yeah, so, so the actual spark that led to the specific book happened in 2013. And I was watching Stop Making Sense, which is Talking Heads concert film from 1984. And in that movie, you see, you know, David Byrne, who is an artist I love, he's at center stage and he has his guitar and he's being doing his weird dances that you see from like once in a lifetime video and those, those moments in pop culture that I loved. But then to his left were two really dynamic, amazing, mesmerizing black women singers. And they were so joyful and so committed to the music in a way that was so compelling to me and I did not know their names then. I know them now. They've actually both reached out to me, which is so like. Oh, that's amazing. Yes, yes. Lynn Mabry and Edna Holt. And in the moment when I was watching this film in 2013, I had the strangest urge to stick my hand through the screen and pull one of them to center stage with David Byrne and to understand what would happen in a partnership like this of two people who were outward opposites but actually had some things in common and to see how their careers would play out in this era of New York City in the early 1970s that I've always been very fascinated by. So it was, you know, that image that really stuck with me and would not let me go in a way that I've never experienced before as, as a writer. You know, I was thinking about these two figures while I was washing dishes or, you know, doing other little tasks around the house at my job because I had a very big job at the time. Um, and I just remember jotting little notes, putting things in my phone and I just, Opal's voice came to me first. And it was a voice that was, you know, partly the Amazing. women in my family. It was partly real life people that I've loved, like Nina Simone and Eartha Kitt and 
all of these women, you know, I, I heard them in, in her voice. And obviously, you've, we've already talked a little bit about what the book's about, but it's literally come out this week. Could you give our audience a bit of a taste of what to expect from it? Sure. So the final revival of Opal and Nev, it's a fictional oral history, so told in interview style. Um, it's about uh, an interracial rock and roll duo. So there's Opal Jewel. Um, she's a Black woman from Detroit. And then there's Nev Charles, who is um, from Birmingham, uh, white. And they, you know, they get together in early 1970s um, and they make music together on the New York scene, uh, sort of a downtown scene. And the story uh, follows their rise and their fall and a dark secret that comes to light uh, when they are considering reuniting for a tour in the year 2016. So there's two different timelines in the book. There's the early 1970s that they're remembering. And then there's the 2016 America, you know, in the midst of the presidential election mm -hmm. and, and everything that that involves. And the impetus for the story being told is that uh, there is a journalist, Sunny, and she has become the editor in chief of uh, a music magazine. And Sunny has her own secret that she's been keeping, which is that she's the daughter of Jimmy Curtis, who was a drummer for Opal and Nev. And Jimmy, this is not a spoiler because it's the first sentence of the book, but Jimmy um, had been having a love affair with Opal and he was killed during uh, the concert that sort of puts Opal and Nev in the headline and is the thing to launch their career. So Sunny is in pursuit of learning about the father that she never knew, but also coming to terms with this figure in Opal that she's always been fascinated by, had very complicated feelings about, and sort of retelling that history in a way that feels uncomfortably personal for her. Mm. And I really loved the way you wrote the book because it was both brilliant and really quite unusual. So in Dawny's book, there's chapters where it's like, as you just mentioned, like the, the editor's notes. And, but then the interviews, you have a chapter about a particular time period or event, and it's from all different people's perspectives, mm -hmm. which is just really fascinating. And it, I found it really gripping. And when Dawny just mentioned this sort of epic event, I was, you know, like it's pinnacle part of the book and really wanted to, to, to find out what did happen, like the details of it. And when how you wrote the book, Dawny, was it conscious to write it like that as this sort of interview? and the editor said it is unusual but done brilliantly or you know did it just unfold that way when you started well it the oral history part of it was always a piece of it and I really have to credit my years as a journalist because that's where I picked the style from you know I worked for an entertainment magazine for about six years and oral history was a form that we used quite a bit to tell the stories of icons or films that everybody loves or television shows. And the thing that was so great about it as a form is that you get all these different perspectives and they don't always agree as to what actually happened. And mm -hmm. I always found it interesting as a reader because you're so engaged in the story and trying to figure out, you know, what the truth actually is. And I liked that feeling and I liked that in writing it and in an interview style, it sort of gave Opal and Nev an icon status, you know? Um, it put them in that position for the reader. And the editor's notes, all of that didn't really come into the book until much later. I had probably written about two thirds of the book in the straight interview style. And then um, I did a workshop and my fellow students said, you know, this is all very interesting. We, we really like this, but we're curious, who is everybody talking to? <laughs> Who's on the other end of the recorder? And I thought that was a really provocative question for me. And, um, you know, I started thinking about, well, what would feel interesting and complex and complicated? And I thought maybe it's somebody who has a personal stake and a personal tie 
to Opal and Nev's origin story, that thing that makes them famous, you know, and, and that's how Sunny came about and along with her, the 2016 timeline and um, yeah, everything, all the editor's notes and her sort of interrupting the story at various mm -hmm. points to give her own context, her personal experience um, of loving this duo and feeling very complicated things about that. And I think that that weaved the book together so awesomely. And Kathy is actually popped up with a question to say, first off, actually, I just want to say that she said that she also absolutely loved your book, yes. and um, which she's read. Um, she wants to know, of all the interviewees, was there a favorite one of yours to write? <laughs> I, I have a couple, but I will say, you know, Virgil was very, yeah. very, very fun to, to write. I loved Virgil because I loved the idea of giving Opal family in New York City. Chosen family, I think, is something, you know, very important um, to, to people. And I loved that he was one of the few people who could check her at the same time that he adored her and was very protective of her mm -hmm. and, you know, was very clear about his boundaries as a friend. And um, there were times, many times when I wrote Virgil, I was just like laughing to myself. Um, He's an awesome character. It's, it's where, where that Oprah review, where you get the, um, the lightness as well. You know, you, ta you tackle such important topics, but with the characters you bring to life that are so real, you know, he adds that lightness and Virgil is just awesome. And I was going to say, Kathy said Virgil was, was her favourite character <laughs> um, in the book. Wonderful. And I know that you also said at the beginning, and I've just mentioned that you wanted the, the people to, to seem real. And that's, you know, it's exactly the case. And a lot of writers plan out the outline of their book. They know before they put pen to paper exactly what will happen, you know, but then others do, you know, approach it really differently. They, they the characters become alive. And I can imagine Opal being a bit of a handful to write about. So like, what was your experience? Was it a bit of both or one or the other? Did you have it all planned out? Did you know exactly how it would end? Or did Opal go and do some crazy stuff that you didn't expect? Yeah, so I'm what, what we have called in the literary world, I'm a pantser, which means that I, I go by the seat of my pants <laughs> and go where the characters <laughs> are me. And at times it's frustrating that that's my natural inclination because I think it makes writing like a process that takes a lot longer because you're figuring it out as you go. But I would do this thing where, you know, um, I would write a little bit and then get stuck and then have to like take time to really think about what what would happen next. So it was always like I only knew what was just ahead. I didn't know the full story and the characters did often surprise me in the things that they did. Um, you know, I won't talk about it too much. Um, but there's, you know, the revelation that ends part one of the book came as a total surprise to me. Um, and I remember the moment when I wrote it, I was in graduate school, I was in my little attic apartment and sitting at the laptop and I just had the Chet Bond character drop this bomb mm -hmm. and I literally sat back in my chair and went, whoa. Oh. <laughs> and also, I don't know where to go from here. Um, and I ended up taking off several months from writing the, the novel. And I, I went and worked on some short fiction instead because not only did I not know what was going to happen next, but I was also kind of grappling emotionally with what it meant to me that a character that I had been writing and really, you know, um, thought that I knew did something so shocking and so and so surprising. And yet when I looked back over the everything that led to it, it also felt very true. And that's the thing about being a pantser is that organic things happen, surprises happen, but they feel very organic. And it leads to that moment that I think writers dream about, which is, you know, the moment that feels surprising but inevitable. 
Um, um, the bit that yeah. you're talking about, Dawny, I got to it and just went, oh my God. Yeah. And when you just mentioned it there, I actually went goose pimpling because, you know, for those of you who have yet to read Dawny's book, you get to that page and think, and you're right, it was totally believable. The minute that character said that, I was like, that would totally, yeah, I can totally see that happening. Yeah. And it's, it changes. It's such an important part of the book. And um, one of the things I wanted to ask is obviously with the writing, from what you just said, you do you not, you don't have a set routine. You, you sort of wait until that creative passion comes through. Is, is that the case? Huh. It is the case, Lisa, and I wish it were something else. <laughs> I, I wish I were one of those writers who, you know, um, woke up at 5 a.m. every single day, no matter what was going on, and, you know, was writing a bit. And, um, and there are moments in my life where I have felt gripped in that way. You know, in the very beginning of writing this book, I was getting up at 5 a.m., before, you know, the sun was up and before I started getting emails and texts and all these things related to, to my job at the time. And it was such a magical period of writing. Um, but sometimes, you know, you do get stuck and it requires you just to kind of, or it requires me at least, just to be a little quiet and to um, listen and to, you um, you know, experience life, you know, and, and to do a little bit of research and to just kind of allow it to, to come to you it's more. Bubble more to the surface. Yeah. Yeah. Let it kind of come to the surface, you know, but there, there does come a point where sometimes you're just procrastinating. <laughs> and when I did feel that I was in that moment, I would force myself to sort of try different things, you know, and be easy on myself and thinking mm. this might, this might not make the book and that's fine. You know, it's just, I'm trying to figure out how to get back into the story and figuring out what comes next. And I have a whole huge honking folder of files that are called like cut parts or like, you know, extra scenes. Like there's so much that did not make the book, but all of that was hugely helpful uh in figuring out what the shape would be in the end so very much like part of that creative process and um peter's also asked you've just touched upon it when you mentioned research like how much research did you do for this book and related to it kathy's also so talked about the footnotes which <laughs> are also brilliant and did you have as much fun writing them as it was for us reading them yeah, I'll answer that, that second question and then come back to the research in a minute. I did have fun reading, uh, writing the, the footnotes and it was, um, it was a moment that allowed me to wear my journalistic hat and mm -hmm. figuring out like how much of the historical context do I want to give, you know, and like what is actually bringing a, a, a new dimension to the story. You know, I didn't want to go too crazy. Like I could have done a lot more of the footnotes, but I decided to be a bit more selective about the one that I used and to try to weave in the history that felt important or relevant. And it was fun because it was like, in a traditional narrative, there's no way I'd be able to wriggle this stuff in, but like, here's a, a way that I can feel like, oh, I'm giving the reader a little something extra, maybe a little something clever to remind mm -hmm. them of other things that, that are real and surrounding Opal and Nev in that reality, um, I think is, is what helps the book feel realistic. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the research, you know, um, the research I did was actually, a lot of it was quite untraditional in the sense that I spent a lot of time um, looking at images, looking at photography from the era and getting a sense of the tone of the times, the style of the times, watching a lot of talk show clips on YouTube and seeing the ways that celebrity operated very differently back then. Um, I think now, most celebrities are very like buttoned up, very polished, very smooth. The edges are a bit worn down. Um, but back then, you know, watching 
John Lennon and Yoko Ono on Dick Cavett chain smoking and talking politics, you know, on late night was very provocative, very interesting and allowed me space to, you know, create a character who would be part of that. Um, but I also, you know, I did traditional research as well. I, I read a book about the Battle of Versailles that very much informs the chapter uh, where Opal goes to Paris. Mm -hmm. um, I very, I, I read um, memoirs. I read one by Debbie Harry, you know, who awesome. has been on that scene in downtown New York, which is really interesting. I read bits of Grace Jones's memoir. Uh, and all of that was just, it didn't feel like work. Like it was part, you know, research is part of writing, but when you're so interested and fascinated, it is also just like these exquisite rabbit holes to get lost in and another good way to procrastinate. If I'm I was going to say, you just, you wouldn't want to stop, would you? And I, I totally agree. Like you're, you're bringing that to your book does make it feel so real. So these, there's excerpts from interviews with Opal and Nev. And I, I felt like I was reading an autobiography. I kept thinking I'd turn the page and see a picture of them. And there's, <laughs> there's obviously in the book, there's a very important picture that's taken of Opal and Nev. And I kept, I kept thinking, where is it? Why have I not found it? Because part of me just expected it to be there in the book because say it did feel so incredibly real that I was reading it and, and Mel has asked I mean I know this book's only been released this week but what if it was made into a film mm. that would be awesome and you know Opal Jewel and obviously Nev as well like do you know who would you love to play these extraordinary characters oh my gosh you know I always I get asked this every interview and I think oh, it's do you I do. I think it's a huge compliment because people mm. are, what they're saying is they feel like it's a cinematic experience. Like mm. they, they feel like they can see it and they can hear it um, in their heads and that it really lends itself to a screen version. And I, what I always say is I'm so much more interested in what you all think about who would be wonderful to, to play these parts because, you know, this would be a dream for me to have a screen version. Um, it's, it's something that I, I would love to happen and I'm hopeful that, that it would happen. Um, yes, my fingers Fingers are crossed, because that would be awesome. And I, I was trying to think of people myself and I mean, obviously, because it's different time periods, that adds a bit of a complication to who would play yeah. the characters, unless it was all done, it depends how it would be filmed. And one of the people I thought of was Angela Bessett, who I absolutely loved, who played Tina Turner. I think she could do yeah. anything. And, yeah. um, you know, she's got that feist and fire um, that's very similar to Opal Jewel. But it's, there's so many extraordinary actors out there. Yeah. And I, You're right. Like there would need to be, you know, if it were to hew pretty closely to the book, there would be young versions of everyone yeah. and older versions of everyone. And that's kind of fun to think about. And, and Kerry is asked, like, when you're not working, when you're not writing, what's one of your favorite downtime things to do? And after reading your book, I feel like, you know, kicking back and listening to some awesome music might be involved with that answer. Yeah, um, I have, you know, listening to music is, is one thing. Um, and and that's, that's the other thing that I forgot to mention about the research is that um, I was in the process of learning about so many Black women in rock and roll that I had no idea existed. And it just goes to show that, you know, when I was that teenager yearning for it, it was out there, but I just didn't know because those women were often marginalized or mm -hmm. positioned as background singers. And so it's been fascinating to learn so much more about those women and to celebrate them. Um, and, you know, I've enjoyed listening to music or getting deeper into, say, you know, LaBelle's catalog beyond just Lady Marmalade, which of course was their biggest hit. We all love it. But 
there's so much depth and really cool rock music um, in their catalog. But I also love watching films. You know, um, my husband and I have watched all the uh, Academy Award nominated films. So we're ready for this Sunday. <laughs> so okay. um, and I love watching, um, you know, really quality television. Um, and British television, honestly, is probably like among, have been like among my favorite shows. Um, I May Destroy You, which was like, like life changing for me watching that show. Um, really incredible show. And, you know, um, trying to read, although reading like my focus is a little bit out the window <laughs> this past, you know, um, these past few weeks. But now that, you know, I have a book out, I'm very lucky to be getting galleys of books that are coming out that are all hugely exciting. And so trying to read those and look out for those is something else I'm doing. Well, that's that leads perfectly to Susan's question um, that came through before the event. And she's asked, is there a particular author or book that has greatly influenced you or your life? Um, who? It's hard to choose sometimes, isn't it? It is hard, but I will talk about a few authors, um, both, you know, uh, contemporary and, you know, iconic authors. Um, there's there's an, a, a drawing, an art piece of Toni Morrison, of course, who um, is a writer that I read her work when I was too young. And so I've been enjoying coming to it with... Um, a bit of wisdom and a bit of understanding of what she's doing. And so that experience of reading her work, I just reread both Beloved and The Bluest Eye um, and, and understanding how layered those, those works are and how um, devastating and how gorgeous. Um, and uh, James Baldwin is another author, of course, that I'm sure a lot of Black American writers cite very often, um, his work, both nonfiction and fiction. Um, contemporary, uh, oh, one more, one more iconic author is Zora Neale Hurston, um, who is from where I'm from, uh, North Florida. And I first encountered her work when I was, uh, Their Eyes Were Watching God when I was in seventh grade. And reading that, I was really floored by the different voices that Hurston uses in that novel. There's the sort of more traditional literary uh, prose that she employs in the narration, but then there's also the dialogue, the African-American vernacular that felt very familiar to me and very um, special and warm. And, and to sort of be switching between those two modes of language was something that felt, I felt seen in that. Um, because, you know, code switching is something that I do, that my family did. Um, and so like those, those were the three. And then contemporary, I love Jacqueline Woodson. Uh, she writes a lot about memory in a very beautiful way. Um, I, I, have, I, I, not, I have not met her yet, but I feel like she's a nostalgic soul like me because the way that she writes about the past, especially in another Brooklyn, um, I live in Brooklyn now and to read, you know, kind of the yearning way she writes about how the neighborhood used to be um, is something, the images of it, the music of it really lingers for me. Um, Edwidge Danticat is a beautiful, beautiful writer. I think we're very different writers, but I don't know of a, an author who's made me cry harder than Edwidge Danticat in Brother I'm Dying, which is her beautiful family memoir. Whew, so many writers. <laughs> That's fantastic. And I, obviously a, a minute, a minute, a moment, oh, a moment ago, before I asked you that, Dawn, you talked about some of these amazing female artists you discovered while you were reading your book. Are there any that really stood out for you um, personally that you absolutely love that you could talk about? There were a few. Um, one is Betty Davis, who was um, kind of a cult funk figure on the New York scene. And you know, she started off as a model and she would hang out with Sly Stone and Jimi Hendrix. And she was married for one very brief and tumultuous year to Miles Davis. Um, but she was also a singer and songwriter in her own right. And 
he would do this very provocative kind of sexual music and her live show was electrifying, but the industry and the critics didn't know how to categorize her. They didn't know, you know, she was very rock and roll and she had a voice that was not really beautiful. She would almost do vocalization. So there was grunting and screeching and yelping in the way that I write about Opal's voice. And, um, you know, when she got tired of executives telling her how she should change and who she should be, she just left the industry altogether. She left altogether, went back to Pittsburgh where she's from and where, as I understand it, she still lives and is, is a bit of a reclusive figure. And there was a documentary done on her a couple years ago. ago. It's named after uh, one of her albums is called um, They Say I'm Different. And uh, it's all kind of, um, she didn't really do an interview for it, but it's all about them trying to figure out like where she was and you know what happened to her career. Um, so Betty Davis was one. Um, polystyrene uh, from X-Ray Specs was an artist that I learned a bit more about. I know there's a film about her that just came out in the UK, um, but like a true punk pioneer, punk icon and a black woman, um, you know, I love learning about her. And then there was one, uh, a woman, unfortunately died young, but Tina Bell, who was the front woman of a Seattle grunge band, like before Nirvana, um, before Pearl Jam, you know, um, and the band was called Bam Bam. And there was just, you know, some journalism done on this band and this woman who, there was a story I read that I was like, wow, that sounds like Opal, <laughs> where um, she, there were skinheads that showed up at, at one of her concerts and she took the microphone like a lasso and beans one of them in the head. And that, yeah, it's something. And I just read about this like two weeks ago. Um, so it was like, wow, wow, because that, you know, something very similar happens um, in the novel. And so it's, it's, it's been very interesting to learn the stories of these women that not a lot of people know about, unfortunately. And, and I, when you said that, I thought of Opal Joel, um, as if we've already talked about an extraordinarily strong woman, really feisty. And it's her character, it almost reminds us how important it is to follow that passion, that inner, pull and not feel like you have to fit in a little box not right. feel like those around you that want you to be a certain kind of person that you have to do that and when you brought her to life in the book like that I was just like she's amazing mm -hmm. you know like such an extraordinarily you know a, a figure to admire and that's why I, I wish she were real and that's why I would love to see it made into a film um so we could actually see her in the flesh because I, I feel like you know the book's brilliant and gosh that would be a brilliant film and especially that that um that bit that we talked about without much detail of the um the big woe moment where mm. one of the interviews something very unexpected comes about but yet when you read it it makes a lot of sense mm. and um one of the things i just wanted to finish with dawny is like what is next for you are you planning on writing another book do you have ideas about where you want to go next with your work yeah i definitely do want to write another book and i'm at the point where I'm kind of in the dreaming phase. And for me, what that means is I'm thinking about new characters and thinking about the ways that they intersect and who they are, you know, trying to um, think about um, people. I, I'm, I'm thinking about the 90s is the next era that I would really like to, to play with. And that's all I know, really. <laughs> I know I'm thinking about four characters and their lives you know, they, they meet in the 90s and then perhaps following them over a, a certain, you know, span of time. And I'm still trying to figure out all those details. I don't really know what the story is yet, but, um, 
And it's also a very, just a very busy time for me. So it's very difficult mm -hmm. to find those pockets of, of quiet time. Um, but I'm hoping when things quiet down, I'll get to sit with those characters and see where they take me. And I think, and obviously I've, I've said it many times, I'll say it again, um, the revival of Opal and Nev, obviously Dawny's talked about letting that creative passion come through and letting the characters in the story take on this journey. And I love that you're planning to do that for the next one as well. It's a brilliant book. It's utterly gripping. And I, to be honest, I couldn't recommend it more. Um, I genuinely think it's one of the best things I've ever read. It's just utterly superb. And I'd just like to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Suffolk Library is a charity and we are so grateful for your support, for attending events like this, to borrowing our books and making donations. You can find out more about our services and ways to support us on our website. And our next author event is actually Monday next week on the 26th with Lindsay Davis. And to be the first to hear about our upcoming author events, do join our online Facebook dis group Discover Reads, which you'll be redirected to when this live event concludes. And you can also find details of our online events on our Suffolk Library's website. Thank you everyone again for coming. And of course, like just a huge thanks to you, Dawny. I think you're an extraordinarily talented writer. I, I believe your book is going to be an epic success and you absolutely deserve it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thanks everyone for coming.